Hello, I'm Sylvia Carmen Covigna, Executive Director of the BASS, and I'd like to welcome you to Curator Culture. Thank you for joining us this Sunday afternoon. And before we begin, I would like to thank the sponsors of this program, the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, for their generous support. I'd like to also thank um, Knight, um, Art Bridges. So a big thank you to our sponsors. And now, allow me to introduce the moderator of Curator Culture, the Bass's Curator of Public Programs, Tom Healy. Welcome, Tom. Hi, Sylvia. Sorry about that. It took a little delay to find my video, but thank you for that. And welcome, everybody, and happy Sunday. We're thrilled to have this conversation today with Jacoby Satterwhite and Naja Moon. And I'd like to welcome them both to the screen. Hey, Naja. How you doing, Tom? I'm well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing, I'm doing pretty good. Happy to be here. And there's Jacoby. So I'm coming to you from Miami. Naja, you're in Missouri, is that right? I am. I'm in a hotel room in Missouri. <laughs> <laughs> and Jacoby, you're in New York? Yeah, I'm in South Carolina, actually. Visiting. It's South Carolina. Wow, yeah. so this is the magic of Zoom, even if we're all <laughs> Zoom fatigued. So um, <clears throat> it's funny because one of the things I'm going to want to talk about with you both is a constant sense of movement that I think defines your work. Uh, for everybody listening, I'm, as you probably know if you've heard me before, I'm not big on, on giving introductions when, when I think you can find people online, but I am interested in, for both of you, you know, you both have, first of all, have such beautiful names, Naja, Jacoby, and it made me think about the whole task and operation of naming. Naja, you, for example, you talk about yourself both as an artist, but as a cultural practitioner and designer and other things. Talk, can you talk us a little bit about like choosing the name for your practice? Choosing, choosing the name for my practice? What, um, you, what you call yourself. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's, it's constantly in flux trying to figure out what is a proper kind of uh, title for that. Um, because I think where I, where I come from in the art space is more about organizing people to come together around art. Um, and so I, I, I still think that I'm an artist, but maybe cultural practitioner speaks more to that activity than it does to actually making something. Yeah. And Jacoby, have you, mm -hmm. you've thought about this issue too, and it happens in your practice, the naming of, of people and things, right? Do I, well, I, I mean, I have the only other kind of alternative name outside of my own in my work is my um, electronic music band, which right. is what scores all of my films. And the name that is Pat in all caps. And it's kind of like a reference to my mother's nickname or sh a shorthand I name for Patricia. But it was also a way to separate my authorship entirely from like, I didn't want to have, it was a way to give my mother agency and my band members agency by not it being just Jacoby Satterwhite that presents music. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So one of the reasons I wanted you both to be in conversation was because your mothers are central to certain parts of your practice. And we're one week away from Mother's Day. And uh, I thought it'd be interesting to talk about that aspect of your work. I, my own mother said once that mothers are cursed with attention. Like, where's dad? You know, we always, focus so much on our mothers for praise and blame and other things. And, you know, I read actually Jacoby that once in an interview said, you barely talk about your dad because he's so perfect, which kind of brings to my mom's point of like, we're cursed with attention. <laughs> I said that. That is hilarious. I don't know just... <laughs> so are you asking me like what? Well, it's funny because I'm, 
working on a, a painting exhibition right now. And the first painting I started doing was with my father. Oh. And he actually isn't perfect in a painting. He's sort of drunk and his tie's loose and it's like in his suit. And he looks inebriated in the face, but it's this big giant smile. And I like that conflation of like a pathology inside of a smile. But anyway, the mm -hmm. point that I'm making is that it's funny that you say that because I'm shifting into another layer of my practice and the headliner for that is my father. But I mean, the other images are not him. They're like crazily deviated from that. But um, to answer your question, I'm, I think I'm in the, the, the patriarchal phase. <laughs> <laughs> now I should talk about that because one of the reasons also we're here is you have a, a big new project out in Collins Park in front of the bass. Uh, so can can you tell us about how, I know your mother is central to this new project, but you've done many other projects. Where, When and where did she start to come in to your actual work? Yeah, I think that, you know, I look so much like my mother. I act a lot like my mother. And so as I've been trying to flesh out what are the things that I'm making, I'm, I'm finding more of her in myself every day. And I think that one of the, it's interesting you bring up fathers because one of the things I've realized is how little I talk about my dad. I didn't realize that I didn't talk about him until I've been having these kind of conversations. So I think um, that might, maybe similar to you, Jacoby, I might kind of go down a different path and figure out, you know, where are the parts of him and me, but I haven't, I don't know why I haven't thought about it. So maybe you could take us into this new project and, and talk about your, your mom and this very uh, monument that's in Collins Park. Maybe even show us some images of things, Naja. Yeah, um, I mean, I guess I, I, I prepared a few things to, to share with you guys is kind of talking about the trajectory of all the things I do more so. Um, mm -hmm. And I can kind of run through that and how it kind of lands on uh, your mother's voice in the back of your head, if that if that works for everybody. Perfect. All right, let me share my screen. All right, you guys see that? I am my mother's child. <laughs> yeah, and so, I mean, I, I was just saying how I look so much like her. So I thought this would be a great place to start. And uh, maybe it could be a pop quiz later or something. Um, who's who, you can't tell. <laughs> uh, but yeah. And I think that one of the things that I've been excited to do through this project also is, is giving me opportunity to kind of thank my mother in public over and over and over again. Um, she's always been super encouraging about my practice and she's a musician and a minister and has done theater things and never pursued a career in, in the arts. And I think because of that, she's been really vocal about, um, supporting me and whatever, whatever I feel called to do. But, um, I'd say my drawings are kind of the grounding part of my practice, um, they kind of work as journaling for me. They're kind of like this stream of consciousness type of thing that a lot of times get translated into text. Um, and then as I've been, I guess, developing them more, I've been working on translating them into music even, which I have a few images here for a new project that I'm working on. and also translating them for notations for choreography. And in these long exposure photographs, um, I'm kind of doing this thing of mimicking my, my mother directing the choir. Um, and so I'm listening to some of my favorite gospel songs and using those photographs as kind of like recording those movements. The movements of her hands? Right. And um, I have notes here, sorry. <laughs> um, this is a collaborative project that I did with Michelle Lisa Polisson. And I bring this up to say that I think one of the skill sets that maybe I've inherited through my mother is that the kind of ability to 
build community, to facilitate conversation, uh, to make things feel maybe a little bit more like home. And so with this project, we had designed these umbrellas to mimic the design district umbrellas and then distributed them to all of our neighbors in Little Haiti. I have a few images here. I have, I have one of those umbrellas. Cause you know, we, uh, yeah, cause I chair O Miami, the poetry festival and that was a collaboration O Miami did with you. Correct. Yeah, Michelle and I really yeah. enjoyed this project and kind of speaking to that, like, how do we how do we build home? I think that these umbrellas kind of function like a flag or to kind of demarcate this place, this neighborhood. And also, is, you know, uh, a tool to get to know the people that we live next door to. And it's based on a proverb, right? A Creole proverb, a leaky yes. roof can fool the sun, but it can't fool the rain. Yes, you remember two years later. <laughs> <laughs> it's so beautiful, though. <laughs> and then um, kind of landing on this project with the bass, uh, your mama's voice in the back of your head. And I think in a similar way, what I invested the most time on in this project was uh, getting to chat with people and having conversations with folks about their mothers and having these really intimate and vulnerable moments with people was really special. And I have. I am the for you. I'm a for you. And then here's a photo of my me and my mother at the at the opening. And then lastly, I wanted to close with a clip from from one of my favorite um, conversations I had. Uh, it's with two of my younger cousins talking about about their mother. <laughs> what else I say? You also yell at us real loud when we go down the stairs. Stop playing on the stairs. And then we run down the stairs. <laughs> so let me let me ask you this: Does your mommy tell you anything about what you can be when you grow up? No. Oh, I, all the time I've been saying it. Want to be a train driver or a plane driver? And I, I don't want to be. No, I want to be. I want to be a teacher and a hip hop teacher. And do I say you can be those things? Yes. Yeah. You yeah. believe in us? What does she say to make you feel that way? She says you are confident. You are a queen. You are a king. You are black. You are an African. Um. Yeah. She mm -hmm. heard like this. Like, and she said it. Um. Oh, well, sometimes you just well, keep up the good work. Yeah. Yes, that's good. <laughs> really good. Like, like this. All right. That's that's it from me. <laughs> <laughs> Come back. There you guys are. All right. So can you just um, fill everybody in who saw those images a little bit about that actual object that the sounds of mother's voices and things are? So it's it's glass on a pedestal. And there's something about the glass, right, that makes it semi-translucent. Or so, what happened, and how you shaped that? Yeah, so it's a, a dichroic film that is around the form, um, and it's a material that I've kind of been obsessed with for a while because it's just aesthetically really beautiful. Um, but I thought that this was an application that made sense. Um, that it's it's reflective, you know, we see ourselves in our mothers, um, our mothers see themselves in us, but there's also moments of transparency. Um, so, you know, I feel like as we get older, we see a more vulnerable side to our mothers, um, uh, have a better understanding of, you know, why they did what they did or um, appreciation of like knowing they did the best with what they had. And I feel like this material kind of speaks to that ever shifting relationship. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I do like, so di, what, how is it called? Dichrotic or something? Dichroic. So it's like two colors? Dichroic. So each it's one a, has two colors in it. 
multiple colors this yeah even okay. when you when you visit it, one of the things i love visually is the the shadows on the ground because the colors yeah. also are shifting simultaneously so the ground is kind of mimicking what's happening on the pedestal are there any so long exposure of recordings of the when you're mimicking your mother's um choir directing oh yeah i've been trying i've been trying to figure out how i could how i can document that from a video standpoint and and still get that kind of residue of the the light trails so if you have ideas let me know (laughs) i will okay just photographs that he does because uh so to that very point to colby you work in an astonishing range of media, but I wrote down once a powerful, like ancient art making technique that you described to about your mother. You said your mother's practice is a gesso or primer for your work. Yeah. Well, Can I mean, I, I kind of have a, it paints really vernacular just because it's like what I've studied since I was 14. So it's kind of like right. <laughs> when I kind of deviated to digital media when I was after grad school. So everything is referencing. But yeah, because, you know, like I, her, her, um, the archive that she left behind is, is sort of like the foundation that made me start making art was what I'm most familiar with. And it's kind of a, something that allows me to pivot to much more dynamic and grander concepts that are related to me and my public experience today and also with the other archives that I bring into work and the collaborators that I bring into work so in a way she's just the kind of primer but she's not the concept you know she's like the the space that the form lives in the real form Mm -hmm. word One of the things about, maybe you could show us some images, Jacoby, because I, I'm interested in what you say about the, about form in your work and how, particularly things with, with new media, how people get distracted and obsessed with that media versus the content. So maybe you could show some things and then we'll talk about that. Um. Yeah, well, can we play the Matrix Rhapsody first? So I always share this, I always share this video um, because it's the foundation of, it's the core foundation and the, um, it's sort of the codex for my practice um, for the last nine or 10 years. Um, I made it in around 2012. And the reason why I made it because I, um, figured out how to make an architectural toy box (laughs) from my mother's drawings. So let me quickly describe what you're looking at. On the left are schematic diagrams my mother created when I was a child till adulthood until she passed away um, in 2016. These drawings uh, she made after her diagnosis with schizophrenia. Their initial intention was um, that she was sending them off to paid programs in the Home Shopping Network as, uh, as trying to get them patented and invented. They're sort of like Da Vinci and diagrams of common objects in the house, but they also are sort of like these memoirs of their, um, the objects are associated with specific memories. And it's a way for her to kind of like, that, you know, with schizophrenia, the brain is out of control and there's a lot of things going on simultaneously. So she would draw objects to contain those memories into one form and space. And as the schizophrenia progressed, the drawings became really interesting, elegant language compositions, double entendres and words and stuff like that. And I realized she was playing a surrealist game, like the Dada, like a, a Dada game and a surrealist game. And it felt like it could coincide with my performance art. And so by tracing and building out all those drawings and architectural programs and Maya 3D, I trace the lines, I add planes to them, then my subjectivity comes in because I'm adding color and I'm building them out into these like forms. And I'm actually, what I built these 3D objects for is because I wanted to composite them into a large arena for me to have these Hieronymus Bosch-like tableaus for me to use my body to perform in and create narrative and video art. And it was sort of like having a four-dimensional painting, having um, the ability to 
you know, play with color, light and space and visual narrative and harmony and sound in a way to like, so that's why she's the primary because it's not about her drawings. It's about me a lot making um, an object environment for me to uh, input thought and idea and concept. Um, but I don't know if you want me to proceed to another video, but. Um, no, that's helpful. I mean, I, I wanted to, I'd love to ask a few questions about that one. Both of you are, have drawing as a real core to your practice. And Jacoby, you've talked about performance itself being drawing. And you, you related that once to the idea of voguing, which seemed so apt to me, this idea that, you know, voguing performs around objects that are not physically there. And I was really curious about so that how that meant performance as a drawing. And then Nadja, I'd love to bring you back in because these ideas of, of drawing with the motion, both in music and your mother's arms and directing. I'm curious if you could both talk more about this different way of conceiving of drawing. Yeah, I think it's something that that I've been thinking about recently because some of the feedback I was getting around my drawings was that um, like from choreographers is showing me how some choreographers have notated dance um, and talking about these directions and and people reading them. And so I tried to kind of go back and look at my drawings and figure out, you know, what what is it telling people to do with their body um, and, and then kind of evolved to those light drawings that I was sharing earlier. So I, I don't think it's, I think that there is a residue in our memory and in our movement that, that looks like something. Yeah, I, I, William Forsyth is a great example who uses like the line and space to kind of carve out drawings. I, I mean, though, that's actually his films is what inspired me to those like performance, uh, rehearsal films that show the kind of drawings he's making with his choreography that kind of like is sort of like the tangent that kind of helped me figure out that they, my performance needs to connect with these drawings in some kind of way. Um, so it's funny you say that. Um, for me, drawing is um, the foundation for everything. And, um, you know, when I reference the, like when I'm, putting 30 of these drawings on the wall and I'm building a conceptual mood board with the themes of the drawings. Like if I'm thinking about pharmaceuticals and medicine and healing agents, I put these drawings on the wall that deal with that. If I'm dealing with a pill capsule or um, a, 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 a pill jar, <laughs> I'll, I'll do 16, I do like 100 variations of the movement. How would you like consume a pill? And I'm using modern dance tropes and things from Vogue and culture in my earlier work um, to kind of give myself angular and compositional movements because I know when I go into the computer, I'm making a painterly compositional tableau with my bodies and angles, different kinds of angles that I could use to draw space within the frame because initially when I make a, um, when I make a film, I do like, eight to 16 still images that I consider paintings or pigment prints. And that is just, I built, I'm, they, I have to, they have to have the perfect composition that could be on the giant mural or on a wall that looks like a Pierre Della Francesca painting or a Rubens painting. And then once I have the eight solid compositions, I figure out how to put all those compositions right next to each other and figure out it, what kind of moving image between each of these images is what going to bridge a visual harmonious narrative? And it's like a surrealist game in itself. It's like I'm playing exquisite corpse with myself because I'm figuring out conceptually how I'm going to tie all these images in together to create a really strong film. So it, it and it's all rooted in drawing in some kind of form and fashion. I, yeah, I think drawings are instructions. Like even if you think about like typography and the forms of letters, you can you can look at those lines like just an image and not a word, and vice versa. Yeah, exactly. So, as instructions like that, Jacoby, are how much when you do the actual 
movement is spontaneous and how much is pre-decided through uh, this well, review. Over the years, a vernacular has developed through just uh, rapid, constant repetition, moving seven hours a day on a mm -hmm. green screen, working in the computer. And then I have like my go-to move. I mean, I don't perform anymore really. It's, I mean, very minimally right. because I'm moving on to different kinds of languages. But like when I have made films and done green screen sessions, because of like doing it for so many years, I have a specific kind of like, as any dancer does, you begin to find a rhythm and a system and a lexicon to tie it in together constantly. And so like there are things, so I have like the spontaneous and the improvisational kind of things, but there, the intention behind the movement is always specific. So if the Very movement specific. is geared towards being, <laughs> pulling a lever, climbing up a wall, hammering, consuming, fighting, giving birth, uh, you know, <laughs> gardening. I'm going to like, there's always like a Baroque and camp and like just gesticular, mo you know, idea associated with it to make it more interesting to make, because when I, I'm animating, I'm usually rotoscoping those figures that are like transparent. Like I'm tracing the hand by hand by hand by hand so I can attach the 3D object to it. So it looks like the figure in the ground are like, you know, to make it more, um, what do you call it? So a lot of figures to actually participate in the space and it seems seamless. Like, I'm, you know, my body, when you notice in my films that my body is actually manipulating and moving the 3D animated space. And so there's this fusion of live action and unreal. But yeah, it, it's just all about the intention. That's where the improvisation comes in mm -hmm. to mediate the intention. So show us that. Okay. Um, that. Can we play? <laughs> I guess we can play country ball, but actually, no, let's play. We are in hell when we hurt each other. No, no, no. Sorry. Let's play country ball. Sorry. I'm so sorry to be such a. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so with Country Ball, this particular film, I was obsessed with the home footage that you see on the right, which is a footage of a Mother's Day cookout in 1989 with my family. Um, we would do this every year. And That's Mother's Day. I never knew that. Yeah, it's on Mother's Day. And it was, we would do it in Sesquik Park in, in Columbia, South Carolina, and the woods. And, um, the thing, I, I, I had many layers of interest in it. First, it was like this whole post-structuralist thing where I noticed things about my behavior as a three-year-old child, gay child, how I wanted to be around my female cousins and I mimicked their movement and everything was geared towards like, you know, a gender expression that I wanted to be in, but my family kept removing me away from. And then I also started to realize that this film looks like it parallels with like Gelede Nigerian masquerade culture and. Um, and, mm -hmm. and they worship the Queen Mother through building dance, sculpture, and interdisciplinary practices with, for ritual. And there's a long ceremony that's like worshiping the Queen Mother and all these sacrifices and praises. So I was like, wow, there's that kind of lineage. And then what I also realized is that this drawing has, this video, this video has um, Jeep, rec recreational material culture that my mother was drawing in her schematic diagrams. And that was the aha moment. So I I wanted to like recreate this video like George Lucas would remaster Star Wars 20 years later. Cause this is a home footage camcorder kind of thing. And I thought, well, what if I found 35 drawings that were recreational material culture uh, drawings that were like carousels, KFC buckets, slides, uh, pools, TV screens. Now, what if I comp what if I composite them into a CGI space and then perform on the green screen in a gesticulation kind of like movement style that was similar to, you know, the movement that's in this film, but probably more vogue and weirder. Like I'm doing, I'm, it's a re-performance strategy. And at the time when I made this film, museums were acquiring performance certificates by Marina Abramovic, Dr. Owen, people like that. And that was in the conversation. So I was thinking I'm making a performance certificate of my own personal mythology. And that's what this, that's how the intention, but with the movement 
shows up in this piece. But it, you know, if you go to the middle, can fast forward to the middle. Uh, yeah, let it go in side of this carousel. So it's gonna go inside of this carousel and it's gonna segue into a scene where I'm holding a torch. And you can tell that like, I intended to hold this torch on the green screen. And then you see the, how my movement is all pivoted around, or pivoting around, or like not pivoted, it's like manipulated. My movement is, sorry. <laughs> my movement is focused on the actions around this torch and how it blows up this green, this American dream sign. And then it crushes the ground. And then I'm like spinning on my leg. And there's a choreography that is totally intent and I throw it away. And then it comes down on me. And that is sort of a, there's like, you know, a premeditated connection where the movement is a script for the piece, you know? So there we go. That, that's, I don't know why that stopped there, but anyway, so you can stop playing it. So Jacoby, one of the things I wanted to ask you about when I when I watch so many of these works and you talk about this pivot and the space kind of being often in the round, it feels like such a vulnerable space to me, almost like a Colosseum space or something different from like, I don't know, something that's more rectilinear or up on a stage. There's something about uh, that way of of, of being viewed that feels like a different kind of exposure to me. Is that it, intentional? I mean, everything, I mean, <laughs> yeah, all, all of the work <laughs> is vulnerable, every single one. Um, and I, and I kind of revisit the work with like a grotesque, ew, I can't, I'm like constantly doing this, but it's vulnerable because. Um, but, ooh, because what, like, like you're, not happy with that work now? No, it's just sort of like, it takes a lot of, I mean, not only does it take my physical capacity to the extreme to like, in regards to like the green screen sessions, but also the labor behind producing them. I see. Them. I have to make them all by myself. I don't have assistance. And like, I think therefore, and everything is, has such magnified intention, some pers pri private intentions and public intentions, intentions that are objective and non-objective. Some pieces, of, you know, I, I kind of have a, a very, very strong distance between the personal and family stuff, like even the relationship with my mother. But um, sometimes it's it's vulnerable because it, the, the private is such a, a material in the work. And sometimes, um, and I, I think like, as I evolve as a human being, sometimes my actions in my work and the interviews and the and me campaigning for the work contradicts itself because I'm growing, I'm changing, and I'm completely rebranding my soul. And like, I put so much of myself in my, it's like, a, it's almost like a, an action painting or a, uh, you think like, you know, it's just such a, so much of me and my thumbprint, whether it's like making the actual work digitally or rotoscoping and animating the work and performing in the work and it being about my personal narrative mixed with my public narrative. It's, yeah, that's it's completely uh, it's a, a castration. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that that I was thinking about watching that last piece is uh, how relatable it is at the same time. Um, and I wonder how much do you think I'm from North Carolina? You're from South Carolina. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. But I want, do you think that place is a, is a big thing that shows up in your work? Do you think that being from the South, um, is a part of the personal that then gets to reach out to a larger audience? Yeah. In that particular piece. Um, and newer works, I would not say, I don't really, I feel like a lot of my life in New York city and Brooklyn and in Europe, in like the like social spaces and social issues and like all of my like, all of the things that have developed in my life after the age 27 are kind of the primary focus of the newer, the last six or seven or eight pieces. But mm -hmm. um, like between Reifying Desire and uh, Birds in Paradise series, it's never, it's, it's, it's there's seldom 
anything to do with the stuff. <laughs> But okay. maybe it does. I wouldn't know. Like I find out these things like late like it's like my work is a Roy Sharp test and I feel like yeah. when I get wiser about things I can see what my what the id is doing versus what I think the ego is doing. Right. So That's I interesting. Don't... So not oh, oh sorry, yeah. No, I was just so gonna go say ahead. I've I've been in I've been in Miami for almost 12 years now. And I feel like I, I can't escape that Southern bellness of my identity, even though I, you know, I haven't been in that place or probably couldn't even get around town if I went back home. Um, <laughs> so it's like, it's interesting that different experience. I mean, I feel like if you were like, if you did like a Rome prize residency or something for you, you definitely see yourself bleed away from it. Cause the environment <laughs> okay. does change everything and i'm mm -hmm. actually in south carolina now and i feel like i'll be coming here a lot more and i can see like me tapping into i feel like there's more things to tap into as i'm here so yeah and i've just been here for three days that's beautiful <laughs> so in an interview i i, Naja, I want to ask if you think this applies to you in an interview that colby did with the architect charles renfro he said he was also a southern he said i have a theory about growing up queer in the south can be summed up in four words, repression, oppression, escapism, and mom. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? I said that? <laughs> no, Charles Renfro no, said Charles that. Charles said that, yes. Yeah. I remember that. But I thought it was funny that, that I mean, you know, it's that's true. queer artists often all over. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you about this idea, Naja, of a stage and about this vulnerability and kind of uh, self-unfolding awareness. In You did this, have this ongoing project, The Aesthetics of Mobility, and mm -hmm. you lived in a truck. And from your bed, you and your partner have done these series of very moving videos and sometimes deeply ordinary and then immensely personal things. Could you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, and we still live there and our house is great. And I don't, I think it's the only reason why we survived the pandemic is because we don't have to pay rent. We live in our truck, it's perfect. <laughs> um, but I think that similarly to what we were just talking about, how the, the personal and the, the public kind of cross paths all the time and you're rediscovering things about yourself. We wanted to have um, conversations about our maybe really literal design decisions and the building process, but then tie them back into uh, our art practice and our influences in terms of um, like historical references and architectural design, but also uh, social references to like the episode in the bed that you're talking about. We we're referring to the Murphy bed being this object that allows this private space to then um, go away when you have guests um, and for one place to function for, for both, for both uh, avenues. So yeah, that's, um, I think that's what we were trying to tackle in those conversations. And we're going to kind of continue that process of seeing why, what are the other reasons why, you know, the closet is so small and the bathroom is so large. I mean, like, what does that mean about your priorities and so on? And so how often do you have to move around to where you can <laughs> park and, and be? You know, that's, that's yet to be determined. Uh, we have a, we have a pretty good setup right now in Miami. So we're, we're stationary more often than we'd like actually. Okay. And it doesn't get claustrophobic. I don't know. It's so interesting that people think that it's like a, a sacrifice to, to live this way. It's really a really homey, lovely place. Um, it looks beautiful. It have, doesn't look yeah. small either. I mean, no, <laughs> but it just, uh, I, I, I find it mesmerizing to, to do that. And, uh, and one of the things you talk about, which again, I thought was struck, I was struck by with the idea of vulnerability. You say at one point that like, you realize you only cried in bed or you cried if you, the most of the time you cried, it would be in bed, but we're in bed with you and it's kind of public. 
I'm going to, I'm going to steal from Jacoby right now and be like, I said that. <laughs> <laughs> you did. <laughs> I said that. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe that's a, uh, in some way that I haven't thought through all the way ties back to that oppression repression quote of being like, you can't be your, your fullest self outside. So maybe those more vulnerable moments of depression or sadness or confusion you have at home in bed. I don't know. I know. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, you're right. The bed is, it's like that Tracy Emin piece. <laughs> like she has the tent, uh, the bed in the gallery. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like messy stuff around. After she had her miscarriage. Yep. Or oh, I thought you were about to tell us all the reasons why you cry. It was like you were getting all quiet. <laughs> uh, I, I was about to, and then I transitioned to chair. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> no crying. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I'm going to ask a really tough question that uh, is about the sense of home. And, you know, it was the title of an album of yours, Jacoby, mm-hmm. uh, other words, you're at home. And we've just been talking about your home, Naja. And Jacoby, you said this. And you could, I said that, but you did. <laughs> so okay. so I don't know if this should be on the rub record, but I'm going to say it. In candid conversations with my Black friends, when we're just kitchen table talking, we talk about how the Black family is literally deconstructed and died. And it started with millennials getting college degrees and moving on. In a way, we all fled. Oh, yeah. I mean, I definitely said that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You want to know? Elaborate on that? (laughs) Yeah, would you both elaborate on that? I mean, I'm interested in in that experience i grew up with a poor white kid but on a farm and shaking the dust from my feet and fleeing was something i had no regrets about i had no sense of being tied but and but i'm i'm curious about this sense of responsibility and and i mean the very powerful language about decimating the family i'd love you to elaborate um well, I mean, I think like there was this like seismic shift in the black family after the eighties and during the crack epidemic went really uh, like went really crazy, and I think that kind of like um, indirectly caused a complex fault line in the family structure for many families, and just like the socio economical kind of like rupture of this country and I think one and also like the opportunity to have agency over your life and go to college and the way like I think my generation and the generation before me generation x and millennials I think um started I think there's I think there's something about when you like find yourself well, it's really hard to, it, I mean, it was, it, it's really hard to survive in the real world. And then when you see yourself growing and finding opportunities, you almost have this imposter syndrome. And then you're on this rat race to continue like um, stealing something that you probably earned. And I think people like get lost in the sauce of it all. And I think the black family kind of breaks up because there, a lot of people, a lot of, it, it is a kind of like an, um, unfortunately, like, I think there's like this collective evasiveness that has happened within many, many people. I mean, I feel kind of weird talking about this, but like for myself, I feel like um, the journey of unearthing my inner complexities with my intellectual, you know, uh, musings has like preoccupied my space so much that I've. I felt like I've even fragmented from my own family, because um, I, 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 I find myself just really deeply into my career, <laughs> and mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, there's so many reasons why. Like, I don't know. I feel like I don't. Get, I can't talk anymore. <laughs> I'm, just, no, no, I'm sorry. I didn't. Uh, not sure, but, 
No, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I think that I can only, I can only speak from, from my lived experience. And, and for me, my family is such a, a grounding source um, that even though I, I haven't lived in, in Durham, North Carolina for over a decade, it's, it's still home for me. Uh, I don't feel, I don't feel that a sense of separation. Um, and even in the things that, that I'm doing here and in other places, I, I feel them with me supporting what I'm doing. And, and I hope that I'm, I'm feeding back into, um, the, you know, my family and how, how they grow the cousins that I shared, um, yes. in the video, you know, those are my cousin's kids and, you know, each generation we're, we're all pretty close. And I think it's one of the, the things that for my family has been really positive um, from the pandemic is that, you know, a lot of us live in different places now, but, but now we use zoom to meet once a month online. And so kind of maybe cleaning up those, those fragments that, that we're talking about. Yeah. I mean, I agree. I mean, like, I don't even feel. Like I just want to great. interrupt for a quick second. Just tell our audience that we love to have questions. So if you, if you type them in on the screen, uh, I will ask them to Naja and Jacoby. Yeah. Jacoby. Sorry. Oh, I guess I just want to reaffirm that I don't personally feel too separated, but I do acknowledge and see mm. like the major difference from how I grew up as a kid when things were really tight versus like, how cousin just like there i can just i think globalism period is what separated us for sure we can stick together with instagram right. but it means like you know it's just something the world kind of like expanded in such a crystallized fashion that naturally there was some sort of i just feel like you know the family structure is definitely different than it would have been in the 80s and 90s when everything was on a landline telephone and everything was localized um so yeah. I haven't been to a family reunion since like 1995, you know, so shit like that. <laughs> <laughs> Be cool to have a Mother's Day barbecue. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think that's going to happen. You know? I guess you know. <laughs> yeah, I should become a mother first. Yeah. <laughs> so... Naja, can you talk a little bit about what's happening with the piece and what you've uh, the here in Collins Park and um, and how other families and and mothers and things have responded? I asked you offline once if if you go there without people knowing it's you and listen in. How has that been? Yeah, I mean, I've been I've been really happy with with the response to the piece. Um, there's definitely things that like I see and hear and I'm like, that's not how it's supposed to be. Um, or I didn't, I didn't accomplish that to, to the level that I wanted, but I think ultimately it's the, the work is doing what it's supposed to do. Um, those kind of experiences I've had being in the park, um, and folks just passing by and, and pausing and being like, is this talking? Is, is this my mother? Like what's happening? Um, and just private conversations I've had with folks of, who are like, you know, my mother passed a year ago. This, this gave me opportunity to potentially kind of reconvene with her in a way that, that I hadn't thought about. Um, so there's been a, a wide range of, of um, responses. And I think one of the things that I try to always mention when I, when I talk about the piece is that in one of the four channels of audio, the, the theme of it is insults and that it's not all it's not all roses um, when talking about motherhood, that some people's experiences are not um, the most joyful ones or the things that they remember their mother saying that are ringing in the back of their head aren't affirmations. And so I wanted to try and be as, give us like a well-rounded um, expression of that monument as possible. My, um, my, husband has a little toy that sits on a table and you just press it and it's uh, a Jewish mother talking to her kids and it sort of says you're gonna poke somebody's eye out with that thing or, are you it's broke are you happy now it's, <laughs> it's a whole litany what? of insults <laughs> why didn't you share this with me that's amazing <laughs> I, I had yeah. forgotten he had it until we were going to do this talk but uh, there weren't any That's loving great. parts it's just the insults <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
Yeah. That's so funny. Yeah. I want that toy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Actually, I do want that toy. It would be funny. <laughs> 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 So I wanted to, we're getting close to time, but I wanted to ask you both about um, one of your pictures now just shows these notation works, drawings, almost like a physical sculpture or painting. Is that, is painting becoming a part of your practice? How, how, it looked like a large shaped canvas or something. Yeah, um, so it, it's also a drawing, it's on, on Yupo paper. So uh, it, it was really, it's a new material that I'm using. Um, it, it allows it to be a little bit more malleable so I can drape the drawings like that. Um, but yeah, I am trying to, I think the experience of, of getting shortlisted for more public artworks um, is having me think about the ways I can make uh, my, my drawings more sculptural. And so that's one of the things I've been trying is kind of draping these drawings, uh, thinking about like Sam Gillum and the way he draped those paintings yeah. um, as a, a point of inspiration. Mm -hmm. So Jacoby, I hesitate to ask you about painting in the traditional sense of painting, but you're doing a painting show. And I mean, it's actually in the traditional sense. Oh, it is. Yeah. And I mean, it's like when is when is it tentatively yeah. November, mid November. Uh huh. And, and I mean, I don't want to give too much information because I think it's yeah, no, no. I think it's confidential. <laughs> but it's painting, like, painting. The, the venue and um the actual show, but <laughs> um yes, tease us. <laughs> yeah, we will stay tuned. Awesome. Well. I really thank you both for being here. Um, love and complicated feelings to our mother's past and present and uh, love to you both too for being here. So thank you so much. Thank you. It was oh, thank you. All right. I enjoyed it so much. All right. Take care, you guys. Bye, Take guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.